welcome to our work session tonight. I appreciate everybody being here this evening and uh, look forward to a lot of information being shared and we'll take an opportunity to look at the uh, meeting agenda coming up this Monday night. See what you think and if there's any changes or anything you need to do, let me know. And other than that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Putnam to start with and then We'll go down the agenda. How's that? That sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. We'll start with Miss Barker. She has a special guest that wants to share some uh, survey results. Very good. Uh, good evening, Chairman Francis and members of the board. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Miss Libby Ray. If you want to, um, you want to come to the mic. And she um, works with Mountain Projects and. And you can tell us your official title, a service coordinator. It's, yeah, I'll, I'll explain. And so, um, as Jill said, I'm, I'm Libby. Uh, I've been with Mountain Projects for several years. I'm actually now the prevention services manager. And uh, prevention meaning that we um, work throughout the far west to prevent and reduce substance misuse. Mostly we focus on youth, uh, trying to prevent substance use among youth because the um, the longer we can delay that, the less the risk they have for developing a substance use disorder in adulthood. So um, the last four years, we've had a grant here in Haywood for, uh, called a Partnerships for Success grant, and it was specifically to prevent and reduce underage drinking and vaping among youth. And I know talking, we've talked a lot, had a lot of conversations with school administrators and teachers and everyone about you know the vaping issue um, but one of the things that really helps us it, it helps us to get funding for the, the work that we do but it also helps us to know okay are the things that we're putting into place helping you know hopefully um, that kind of thing it helps us when we can get some information and so uh, we were fortunate we were able to do a survey right before the pandemic shut everything down uh, so um, we, we worked with the school administrators to, to get a survey done. At that time, we just really collected results from one high school. I think it seems like, if I remember right, Pisgah was the, on, the only high school that participated at that time. And it was just ninth grade students, but it gave us some good information. Um, and so then we came back this year and said, would you all allow us to, to do this again and, and kind of compare? So. Um, you all graciously agreed to let us do that, and so we got a ninth grade survey done again in February and March. Uh, and this time we had even more participation. We, we actually had participation from three of the high schools, uh, and we had, I think, a two, about 256 responses. And we did learn a lot. Um, and I've, I've got, I'm gonna introduce Drew here in a minute. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Reynolds out of Atlanta. He's been a big help and he's way smarter than I am about um, in, you know, putting these numbers together and what we can learn from all that. But I, I will tell you, you know, I, I was telling Drew earlier today, one thing that there's no question about is that this community cares about its youth. Uh, and we all have similar goals in mind. And so um, Jill, Jill wanted me to talk just briefly about some of the stuff the ways we've worked together over the last few years. So I, I hope you've received this or had a chance to look at it. Drew put together this written report and it, it basically tells a lot about the survey, but also on the back page, it was hard to like put four, worse, four years worth of stuff on, you know, <laughs> in something real readable for y'all. But I wanted to give you some examples of things that we've been doing. You may have seen the billboard uh, you know, just east of here, coming into Clyde that we had for a good two, two years at least. Um, we've had radio ads, we've had print ads, we've, we've worked with the schools, like, you know, gotten permission to make things available, hopefully getting them in the hands of parents, um, about things that they can do to, to have conversations with their youth and also things, real practical things they can do to, to reduce the likelihood of kids getting and other hands on alcohol and, and other things. So, um, I'm trying to think if that was pretty well sums it up, would you say? Um, you know, everybody's been very gracious. We've, you know, anytime somebody's asked for information, we've tried to, like principals or um, 
lead teachers, you know, we've, we've, we've tried to sit down and talk about, you know, what, what their needs are and how, how we, you know, what we can suggest and that sort of thing. So, but I want to let, I know you all, when you, when you gave us permission to do the survey, said we'd really like to hear about it after the fact. So that's why um, Dr. Reynolds and I are here and happy to answer any questions. But I'm going to let him take over. He wasn't hearing us earlier, so can you act like you hear now. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can, I can okay. hear you. Can you hear me? All right, so I'm going to let you get into this survey then. And uh, we've, got your, we've got your slides pulled up. Oh, great. Do I need to share screen or do you all have them already? I'm sorry, what did you say, Drew? I was going to say um, I can share my screen to be able to bring up the slides if that's helpful. Okay. She's, she's got it up too, okay. so she's on that first slide right now. Oh, okay, that's fine. Well, then maybe we, I'll just kind of have you all click through. That might be easier. Okay, well, wonderful. It's nice to meet you all again. My name is Drew Reynolds, and it's been a joy to work with Libby um, and with Haywood County Schools on this important survey. And so we can go ahead and start with that second slide, and we'll dive right on into um, the key findings, and then we'll spend a little time talking about a little bit more about the survey, dive a little deeper. But I think one of the most compelling things to come back from a survey like this is that when we surveyed ninth grade youth in Haywood County, we realized that the vast majority of them are living drug free. And I like, think that's an important point to emphasize over and over again uh, when you do these surveys is to recognize that those are the, youth, the choices that most youth are making. Um, and what we find too, is that when youth see other youth choosing not to use, um, that can be one of the most compelling ways, um, compelling sort of factors that assist in prevention. Uh, we see that, his, I guess, compared to the last survey, use of e-cigarettes is trending down and that the leading substance chosen by youth was tobacco more so than alcohol. Um, and then we talk about protective factors, things like parent disapproval, peer disapproval, perception of risk, and then limits to access. And these four kind of big protective factors are things that were associated with less youth when, well, less youth, sorry, use when we um, looked at it in the survey. We can go to the next slide. Um, as Libby mentioned, we did one in 2020 and then again in 2023. It was voluntary and anonymous survey. Parents and students could opt out. And we had 256 students across three schools. And so we feel pretty confident that the results are pretty representative of, of ninth graders across the county. We'll go to the next slide. And then one more. So to begin with, we to get a sense of, of use in the community, the standard practice is to ask about um, having ever used and during the past year and then what we call 30 day use and that's kind of the most prevalent like our are, are youth using currently and in the moment and so looking at 30 uh, day use that's the kind of indicator that we look for for that living drug free one for 86.6 percent but at the very bottom there you see during the past 30 days have you used any of the following and we look at both tobacco and alcohol and you'll see that compared to 2020 tobacco use is down from 22 and a half percent down to 12.1 percent um, and then alcohol is right about the same. The difference between 9.8 and 10.2 is, is probably not much. Um, and so we are really, uh, I think, a, a celebration of the, of the work um, from this survey is that the prevention messaging and the conversation about risks around uh, youth vape use um, is, is yielding results. And that's a really positive finding from this survey. Go ahead and go to the next one. <clears throat> So we know that youth <clears throat> make decisions based on what they see around them, what their experiences are with their parents and with their peers. And what we see, <coughs> excuse me, is that three in four parents, youth report that three in four of youth say that their parents would say it's wrong or very wrong, uh, you know, to use um, alcohol. And we hope that we could try to bring that number a little bit up, but down from the prior year a little, or the last time we'd done the survey. So we kind of hope that we want to have those conversations with parents that it's important to engage in conversations about alcohol and tobacco use with their children. And they kind of give them some language and things to engage in that conversation. Because sometimes parents you know, might feel like they, they don't have the information and are prepared to do that. We also look at asking friends, you know, if they think it would be wrong or very wrong. And while the vast majority of youth don't use, only about half of youth would say that their friends would say that it's wrong to use drugs. And what we find actually is that there's actually a, a bit of a misperception among youth. You think more of their peers are using and are permissive of drug and alcohol use than actually are uh, from the data. And that's something I think it's always interesting to present to ninth graders 
uh, because it gives them a bit more of a, a clear sense of how um, their peers are acting and behaving. So go ahead and flip to the next slide. When we look at perceived risk, this is asking you, you know, do you think it would be a great risk or a fair risk um, to use, uh, to smoke cigarettes, use smokeless tobacco, Juul, and then you know, drink alcoholic beverages, for example. And these numbers stayed pretty consistent with the last time we'd done the survey. It was a little bit lower for alcohol. Uh, so we see that it seems like <laughs> on risk and also on parent permissibility that there might've been some, some lack, um, some you know, changes in an unfavorable direction in the survey. But overall, you know, four and five ninth graders are saying that there'd be a great or fair risk to using tobacco and alcohol. We'll go ahead and the next slide as well. When it comes to access, <clears throat> this is an important question to ask in these surveys because it gives you a point uh, in terms of where we might want to intervene, right? You're going to already hear a little bit. It's good to have conversations with parents about talking about um, you know, disapproval. It's good to talk to peers and it's good to talk about kind of perceptions of risk. That fourth protective factor, access, this gives you a good sense of you know, where are youth accessing alcohol and tobacco, particularly because ninth graders are underage. Uh, and what we see is that most of them um, report getting it from older friends. And so having those conversations with youth who are recently uh, you know, of age to be able to purchase and otherwise acquire these products, you know, it's good to have conversations around how to, to not share that, um, and especially not in uh, ninth grade. But also talking a little bit <clears throat> too about, you know, we see that um, purchasing from a store that we saw at 42% said that that's where they purchase the tobacco vape products. Um, and then also, you know, we have talked about older siblings and the one at the very bottom there is about taking it home without my parents' knowledge um, or sometimes parents providing it themselves. And so having that conversation with youth about where they're accessing it and then kind of saying, can we have conversations with parents around you know, secure alcohol storage, for example, uh, and discouraging use at home. Can we have conversations with community members about not um, sharing uh, alcohol and tobacco with underage minors? Those are important conversations to really be thinking about. Note, though, that this data is only for those who report using. So it's not the whole group, it's just of those who use, what percent said they have from these sources. And we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we did ask a question about risk of getting in trouble, just to kind of get a sense of, you know, do, do youth perceive whether it's out in the community with law enforcement, whether it's at school or whether it's with their parents that, you know, one area may be more permissive or more risky um, in terms of use than others. And what it appears is that the data, there's not a whole lot of difference across these two, um, but that it's, it's likely, um, you know, more sort of in the parent guardian realm where you see that uh, parents, youth report, maybe not getting in as much trouble. And that's not necessarily a perfect question because, you know, what is getting in trouble me in terms of, you know, what their parents would approve or not, um, but it can be useful information just to get a sense of, of kind of how youth perception is going. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> As Libby referred to in that last page, this gives you a bit of a sense of, you know, what prevention looks like. You know, when we see survey results like this, and, you know, we, we notice that we see overall use being down for tobacco use um, in these areas, which is really promising and great. So we know that things like communications pain, sorry, campaigns, that are emphasizing the risks of vaping seem to be having some effect. You know, whether that's the work that we're doing or just the broader conversation, it's probably a little bit of both, uh, but we know that it's, it's good to continue that work. Um, when it comes to things like restricting access, you know, what can we do to encourage secure storage of alcohol and tobacco products at home, for example? And you can see these are some different communications campaigns and, and, and um, you know, evidence-based environmental strategies that organizations like Mountain Products have taken on to help address some of these challenges. Um, and I'm also thinking about how to support parents, you know, I mean, these conversations are not always easy. So, you know, how do we help parents have a conversation before prom or homecoming um, about uh, drug and, and alcohol use? And, and these types of prevention strategies can be really helpful for community members who just want to have more knowledge um, and then feel kind of prepared to make good and healthy choices. We'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, so lastly, some recommendations from the survey, um, certainly around strengthening community relationships. So hoping to continue to work um, and build kind of a prevention ecosystem, you know, with organizations, schools, government agencies, nonprofits in Haywood County um, and beyond to kind of build up a community around um, substance use prevention work. The survey is going to be really awesome um, for to continue this work and planning moving forward. You know, and our, our group is going to be meeting together to talk about these data and how we can kind of think about different environmental strategies that might help us um, continue to help youth make um, good and healthy choices. And then lastly, you know, a good recommendation is always to share data. And that's why we're here today, 
So the, the community and the public can see this information um, and can make sense of it themselves and then be able to also use that to inform their conversations with community members and with youth as well. So uh, with last slide, we can say thank you so much um, for uh, that, this opportunity to share this information you and for, with you all and I'll open it up for questions. Drew, you said uh, parents limiting access to like storage of alcohol and tobacco. Did, was that both tobacco and alcohol, just alcohol? And what what suggestions would you have, like a locked cabinet or a closet or something? Or I mean, somebody that stores beer in the house. I mean, it's like the refrigerator's there all the time. That's a good question. Um, and I'll actually turn it over to Libby because she can talk a little bit about some of the uh, work on this. I know there's, I could give an answer, but I think she'll give a better one. So <laughs> I thought I could put you on the spot. Well, I, no, that's okay. Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked that question. We, because um, this is something that's, as far as I know, been new to Haywood County, and we've really only s started trying it out in the last year or so, but we did start just making available um, their, their refrigerator and cabinet locks. Um, so you're absolutely right. I, I've heard, you know, stories from various people about, you know, one of the best ones was from someone whose neighbor saw a kid from down the street get into this, this other person's garage and get beer out of the fridge in the garage, right? And then go, go on up the street back home. Um, so we've actually, people have responded really well to that. Like we weren't sure if people would go, oh, that's, you know, but people have, have taken them and, and in fact I'm going to be at a couple of events coming up and you know we'll have them available for folks there's no strings attached we do ask them you know can we follow back up with you to, to find out have, have you used it you know is it working for you but um, that is one of the things absolutely is people and also encouraging people just to pay attention you know like maybe they've got one bottle of something up above the fridge or stuck to, stuck away somewhere and they've even forgotten about it but the kids know, you know, the kids know it's there. So we encourage people to monitor their alcohol, pay attention, and if at all possible, secure it to reduce access. Yeah. Yeah. I had some alcohol stored up above a cabinet like you're talking about, and I'd forgot I even had it. I'd had it from 10 years ago. Didn't even, didn't even use it, but it was there. Mm -hmm. And then I go and investigate, and man, a lot of <laughs> uh, kids, where's my alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The bottle's still there, but there's nothing Yeah, there. and then it's watered down or something like that. So it can happen. Absolutely. It's very true. That's the reason I asked the question, because without short of a lock or something, it limits access. I, I think it's pretty well open season. And the, and the lock is not, you know, look, that's not a guarantee by any means, but it's, it sends a message for that. one. And, you know, it just makes it a little bit harder. It, and I think it says, okay, I, we are paying attention. <laughs> so. Very true. As opposed to somebody saying, well, it's there if you want it, you know. So, and I think that's one thing that, that we've recognized trying to, to help people understand is, you know, getting past this idea that, oh, it's a rite of passage or it's just kids do this, you know, and that kind of thing. And what we know now that we didn't know years ago is that I mean and teachers especially understand this you know and if you're a parent you understand this the brain the part of the brain that makes good decisions is not that's the last part of the brain to fully develop and so the younger someone is you know I the way I say it sometimes is they ain't done yet like I have a 20 uh <laughs> How old is he now? 21 year old, you know, he still ain't done yet. Like, cause he's, I still have to look at him sometimes and be like, son, you know, so, um, <laughs> where was I going with that? So anyway, you know, the longer we can delay them introducing substances that yeah. can potentially impact that brain development, yeah. like I said, the much lower their risk is. We're not saying never, or we're not saying just say no. We're saying, you know, these, this is what you need to understand. So yeah. as long as you're under my roof and you're under age and blah, 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 we're, this is the rule kind of thing. Good. So, very good. Um, I think what you're doing is excellent. I, and, but my question is, 
Have you thought about maybe trying to do middle school, starting it, maybe surveying them at seventh grade and then catching them again at ninth and sort of comparing that data? Because, you know, there is an issue in middle school, just Absolutely. like in high school as well. So, no, I'm really glad you raised that issue because that was one thing Drew and I wanted to just mention was that, you know, we have only done this with ninth graders. However, um, you're, you're absolutely right. You can get a much better overall picture of what's going on if you if you um, survey multiple grade levels. So a lot of schools, including you know farther west of here, a lot of schools will survey, you know, like the, it might be seventh, ninth, eleventh grades or something, and that gives you a, a truer picture. And if you if you do that consistently over time, then you can start to kind of see what's trending like like um, Drew said what's trending down what's trending up I think the thing about the e-cigarette use trending down that was a shock because it's like that is not the perception at all but that's an example of where had 11th graders been included or even maybe the middle school we might get different results right so it's it's kind of hard to say what what's going on there um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah. Are y'all considering doing that maybe in the future to add multiple grades? You know, to be honest, that's really up that? to you all. That's really up to the school. Um, I, we certainly can make that happen. Um, we can. There are resources to make that happen. But I think it's and it might. You know, that might be something for a, another conversation to to look at. Well, what are the options? What kinds of questions do you want to ask? This was a pretty limited survey, because we did it. Um, it was funded by this particular grant, and it, we only really asked about underage drink, underage drinking, and and vaping. Um, but a lot of schools. And as I said, including farther west of here, um, Jackson County, I think Graham County does, they, they ask a broader set of questions. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's, that's all up to you all, really. And we can, we can work with you all to make it happen. And I'll speak to that too, you know, um, Libby and I have worked well together and, you know, we did take that survey and I think it was Dr. Putnam and mine really made it match the curriculum for ninth grade because there are helpful living standards and so and the questions we deemed appropriate for our students. So, and you had to look at that too and that's, you know, and so I think that's why, you know, we chose ninth grade. Also, all of our ninth grade students take health. And so that was an easy way to try to capture that survey within their health class in ninth grade. But I'm sure that she was always open to surveying more students. So that would be up to up to your, whatever you guys think, Chairman Francis. And yeah. And, and I'll, I'll say real quickly too, to Jill's point, because we only surveyed ninth graders the first time around, it, it kind of made sense to survey that same, where I thought it did, to survey the same grade level this time. But moving forward, you could certainly expand it if you wanted. Very good. I have one more question. Um, you said the perception of the kids is that like more people is doing it than they think. So how do you change that perception and what kind of program? I mean, I'm sitting here thinking maybe older kids could come and talk to them and say, look, not everybody's doing it. We don't do it. Well, actually, uh, there's a whole, <laughs> yeah, the, it's it's called <laughs> positive social norms. And it's, it's really, it's not exactly what it sounds like. But yes. A lot of, um, what a lot of places will do is they'll use messages, like some of the ads that we had up on the screen, they'll, instead of saying some of those things, they might say, you know, uh, nine out of 10, eight out of 10 uh, Tuscola High School students are living alcohol and drug free or something like that. You know, um, it, it looks, it's, it's more effective messaging than that, but that's the bottom line is you tell them. It's like you, you can do a whole ad campaign around the fact that, look, most of the people around you, your, your age, are not doing this. And, you know, I've even considered, like with the whole thing, uh, we're not doing it here right now, but farther west, we've, we've started some messaging about youth marijuana use and, and trying to get the message across to parents that, look, most parents don't let their kids <laughs> do this. You know? um, that's well, unless you put it on social media, I mean, if you're talking about going down the highway, there's not a kid in this county that's not doing this. 
We're not looking at No, you're right. If, if you're tar and I'll be honest with you, that's one reason for for the campaigns that we did here. Okay. We targeted parents primarily. Um, well, and, and that w there were a couple reasons behind that. But you're right. If you're going to try to target youth with messages, you have to go a whole different route. Okay. Um, you have to be where they are. And y you're right. That's, that's going to be <laughs> on their phone. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Ms. Good questions. Thank Great you questions. Very, much. very yeah. interesting, and yeah. we appreciate you reporting back to us on the survey. Sure. And if you think of something later, you know, for, for Drew or for myself, I'm sure we'll be glad to okay. follow up with you. So, Can I get a copy of that survey, the results? Sure. Have I got you one? should have already have okay. access. Thank but you. I just asked Ms. King also to email it to you. So okay. Have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate oh, thank it. You, thank you. Absolutely. And, and thank you too for all because I know it's um it's not easy being in a role like this so <laughs> having to make a lot of big decisions um, so thank you thank you thank y'all so much thanks Drew thank you thank you Drew Next we have Mr. Haynes. Yes, sir. Patrick Smathers. Yes, sir. Uh, Chairman Francis, board members, for the first thing um, that I have to share with you all tonight is um, just an update on our property acquisition. <clears throat> so Dr. Putnam and I met with the county commissioners and went to that meeting um, and formally asked for the drawdown out of our capital or sales tax funds uh, on Monday. And the capital sales tax, tax funds, again, can only be used for capital products. So it's buildings, it's renovations, it's property, things like that. Um, it can't be used in any way to offset current local expense, which is positions and your day-to-day -day operating costs. So um, with that being said, they did uh, approve that drawdown of $1,680,000. And um, so we have it scheduled. Well, it was scheduled for Tuesday the 15th, but now it is um, Friday the 18th um, to go ahead and close and you know purchase that properly, property formally. You have anything to add on that? Uh, I just need to go over a couple things with you. Uh, we, would, we will close on Friday. Uh, the only thing I just need to tell you, there are several old easements that they, they're, they're just like the State Highway Commission, uh, water easements, water and sewer lines with Waynesville, uh, and looking at the engineering plan, none of them would affect what we want to do. It'd be nearly impossible at this point in time to try to go back and figure and survey out where all these old easements were, but generally they're right along the highway there yeah. and along the creek. Not aware, and I talked with Mike about it, I'm not aware of any any water lines or sewer lines going through the property except what was shown on that one one picture. So I don't see anything. The title is clear. Uh, I don't see any problems. We'll close Friday, and uh, we'll be yours. So at that point, when we do close, uh, we'll contact the town of Waynesville uh, so that they can rezone it for us um, as we uh, got past or the, the town council of Waynesville passed for, for us um, to the Raccoon Creek uh, overlay. So that way it's a mixed use overlay and we'll be able to use it for what we need to use it for. So we'll call them at that point and do that. Um, we'll also reach out to North Carolina Emergency Management so we can um, <clears throat> work on getting the reimbursement for part of that property, and so that'll be $850,000 as a reimbursement from the funds that they're going to be providing to us um, to relocate our flood prone facilities here in Clyde. And then the next step there would be to begin planning and working towards actually, you know, moving these facilities and building those buildings. So that's the, ed uh, the education center here where we are, along with the boardroom and our instructional technology center. Very good. Appreciate you doing that, and thank you, Mr. Smathers, for your work on the title stuff and and presenting to the county commissioners. I appreciate that. It sounded like it went really well, and we appreciate them and their support 
of this land purchase so we can get some buildings out of a floodplain. Not a bad idea. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> second thing this evening. Speaking of I, floods. Right, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, some updates on, um, well, field updates in particular, the, the flooded fields. Um, first is Pis Pisgah Memorial Stadium. Um, I'm sure you all have seen pictures recently of lights on and scoreboards on. Uh, there was a scrimmage there last night. It was awesome. You know, kids were happy. They were playing. People were in the stands. They were running around. Concessions was open. It looked beautiful. Um, John Bergen and his guys, along with our maintenance department, have done a fantastic job um, getting us there. Um, everything that needed to be done is done other than just a few things. Um, we did get the temporary certificate of occupancy, which is, you know, kind of the, the go ahead, hey, you're good, everything's fine, use it. Um, we do have, there's a 400 amp panel box on the visitor side for the concession stand. It powers over there that hasn't come in yet, but we got a temporary permit to use the old electric for that. So it's got power all as well. That actually was shipped. Um, I talked to John Bergen yesterday, I believe it was, and, and it's been shipped. So it's on the way and it should get switched out soon. Um, we are also missing the cabinetry <clears throat> in that visitor concession stand. And that was because it had been removed before they came around and wrote down, took a, you know, a, I guess a survey or took a, took a, um, I don't know the word I'm looking inventory. for. Inventory, that's the word I'm looking for, thank you. Took an inventory of all the stuff that was there that needed to be ordered and done and somehow or another that had already been ripped out and so it didn't get inventoried. But they've added it on the back end and he said within a month we'll have that and it'll be in. Um, but we've got a plan in the meantime for some storage in there and for some tables and we've talked to, to Pisgah and they're on board and we're gonna make sure all that's in place. So that'll be set. Um, the only other thing is we are gonna pave <clears throat> underneath the home side, that strip that you walk on down there because there's a big pothole and there's some cracks in that and that's gonna happen this coming week and it should be ready to go for the first home game on the 18th. Um, in addition to that, with softball and baseball, um, all the electric, my understanding is all the electric for softball has come in and they'll once once the football field is entirely done or the stadium's entirely done, they'll shift up there and begin working on that again. That one will get taken care of. We're still waiting on an 800 amp panel box for the baseball field. Um, but in, again, talking with John Bergen, he sees no reason why it shouldn't all be in and be ready and be set done before spring when they would be playing on that. Um, and the other one, this isn't a flooded one, but just an update. Um, the Bethel Middle School turf. The turf is done. Um, however, the GMAX test, it took longer to get it done than they had originally thought. And that's just the, the test that makes sure that the, uh, yeah, the, the compaction, so the collision on it to make sure it can withstand and absorb that uh, kinetic energy when the collision happens on the turf to make sure it's safe. So when that gets done, um, we'll get the results back, which, should, well, excuse me, it's done. So as soon as the results come in, the only other thing that has to be done on that turf is for them to put up padding along the inside of the fence to ensure that's safe. Um, they should be, at least Dalton King with CDC, I've been pestering him every day. <laughs> um, but uh, he said that they will be there Monday morning. So we'll make sure they're there Monday morning and they'll start working on that. And as soon as that's in, we can get kids on that field, even if the few other little things aren't quite done yet. But the contract ends at the end of next week. So everything should be done by then. Very good. One question on the, I know the, I guess FEMA money, are we gonna have to, I know we're waiting and to get everything finished before we can get reimbursed. Is that going to be spring before we're going to get finished with the baseball and everything to get reimbursed? Or are we getting to the point that we can get reimbursed yet, I guess is my question. We're working towards that goal. I do believe we have to have finished and closed out everything before we can get the reimbursement. They're working towards that. So as fast as they can go, we're going. Taylor, we've applied for some of the money already, correct? 
what we have fronted or paid toward the project we've already applied for. The reimbursement process, as you can imagine, is pretty, pretty slow. I know Tyler told us in finance that we got to get it complete to get any more money is the way I understood it. And if it's going to be wintertime or spring before the baseball and softball is done, then we're still sitting on a lot of money waiting to. Sure. Well, I know, um, you know, John's working is, is the stuff's coming in, he's getting it done, you know, and he's got a very long time technically to get it done, but he's hurried along and, and his stuff's coming in. Like I said, he's, he's working hard to get it done as quickly as possible for us. So you can apply as things get done for that money, but not the whole amount. Is that right? Correct. Correct. And we're to a point where we've requested all we can request at this point till it's complete. Very good. Could I ask a question about the <clears throat> flood money? And I may have missed it since I've missed a couple of meetings. But I know that there was some some issues with getting reimbursed on the building next door and that we were only going to get they were going to originally give us some and we were filing appeals and what's the status of that it's funny you ask that um i actually we just we just got an update today um actually i think it was yesterday but we found out a little more information today about it um <clears throat> so <laughs> as everything goes with fema or it has been in this process it's just kind of went around in a circle and in a circle and we've got documentation where they told us to go ahead and appeal and that we should appeal and that's our only option is to appeal and now we've been told that you know in an email and then we asked for clarification as to really what it meant um, but we've been told that they never gave us a, a decision memo or a decision memorandum and so because of that we actually weren't supposed to have appealed yet and so we've got to get that and then we can send everything into appeal again <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate the update. <laughs> yes, you're, you're welcome. Our government at its finest. Sorry, I asked. Sorry, I asked. Just get flooded with information. I'll, I'll just add on. Uh, the great news in all of this, it has been a long, arduous, nerve-testing process, uh, as, you, as all of you well know, for our kids, Number one, and most importantly, for our parents, our community, this board, the school system. However, there are walkthroughs that we will not have to endure, nor will any other board have to endure, and heaven forbid there's ever another flood instance. We will not have to obtain a flood permit. It's done. We will not have additional flood mitigation measures from FEMA. Those are done. That's those big platforms you see. Um, when or if, however you want to phrase it, uh, another flood event occurs, it'll be more in our control. We will be able to call the in our insurance, the, the insurance company who insures our field, and say we've, we've had damage, come out and assess it. They'll cut us a check and we'll start the work. The electrical, you know, again, the infrastructure will be, that's the big platforms you see around the stadium. Not super attractive, but necessary. Uh, has that infrastructure out of the flood plain. It's two feet above flood stage, I believe. And so you're really looking at reconnecting to that infrastructure. If, if the uh, conduit carrying the, the connecting wires is compromised, you pull that loose and reconnect. But your infrastructure, your panel boxes and all that will be out of the, uh, the floodway. So um, we've done it the right way. Um, it has not been as fast as any of us want it. Um, but FEMA has paid for it and continues to pay for it, uh, which freed up, you know, and made sure that we had money suitable for our entire school system. Um, quite honestly, we wouldn't have had enough to complete all this work anyway. Uh, but it will be much quicker winter if we ever need another repair. Thanks for the update on that, because we get a lot of questions out in the community about it. Absolutely. Now that the lights are on at Pisgah Memorial Stadium, a lot of those questions have kind of faded away, which is good. It was, it, it's a, it was a very nice sight.
Yes. For some football. That's Amen. Right. And other sports. Soccer. Soccer, cheerleading, etc. And PE classes. Amen. Very good. All right, Miss Garland, if you could find an available microphone. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. You should have before you a summary sheet of our ESSER funds. <coughs> it is time to do an update. We haven't done one in a few months. All of the funds that are not highlighted have already expired. Those are gone. Anything in yellow are funds that expire this coming September, so in a month and a half. And you can see we have uh, just a little bit left to spend down on that. Most of that will be left or be spent down in August when we pay out final summer school payments. And then anything in green expires next September. We anticipate using most of that um, money this school year. And of course, it's all based on ADM, ADM state funding and a state budget, which we're waiting on, but we're estimating to have about 50 positions completely funded from ESSER this school year. All right. Are there any questions? Thank you. And I, I will just comment, uh, Taylor and her group, as well as Ms. Barker and directors, have, and uh, Mr. Haynes have done a great job spending this ESSER in a um, informed way and a and an intentional way that benefited our kids, whether it was um, recovering learning loss or uh, improving the overall educational environment. They've done just a wonderful job, and, and we hear that from other uh, from state auditors and other. Uh, folks from around the state that they, they really like our ESSER spending plan. Taylor, when did you say that all of that would be spent? At September what point? September of 2024. September of 2024 is the last deadline for the ESSER three funds, and those are the ones in green. Okay. Thank you. I don't anticipate we will have much of that left, though, in July of 2024. Okay. It, we got to... If anything's left, we send it back, so we need to spend it, right? Yes, our plan is to spend, spend everything we can spend. Yes. We've done a great job so far, it looks like. I see a lot of 100% over there. And zeros, it's good. Zero percent remain. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you for the update. All right. Dr. Putt. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to cover a couple of items. The first is an ESS contract addendum. ESS, as you, if you will recall, is our substitute service. Uh, they provide um, employment for our substitutes and they fill vacancies within our schools. Um, throughout the, uh, the superintendent listen and learns, I, I learned a lot from those, by the way, and those will continue. We're going to do them in a little, little different form or fashion this coming year. I'm probably going to go spend a half day and go through all the classrooms and the reason i'm doing it in that format is because that's what our staff told us they wanted to, me to do so that's what i'm going to do i listen um, and um, in hearing the voices of our uh, teacher assistants and others um, there was some discrepancy with what we paid long-term subs um, and what they actually earned. And it was a good bit different. Um, if you'll remember, we put a, a $160 per day pay rate on long-term subs because we were having a hard time finding them. Uh, well, that, that amount has created some hard feelings amongst our teacher assistants who oftentimes do end up conducting uh, the lesson. Um, and that's not a knock one way or the other. It's just a, a matter of choosing the, the level of expertise, whether it's the teacher assistant or the substitute, and they kind of work that out. So uh, this amended ESS contract, what I, w uh, what I hope to bring before you Monday night for a decision, this is just for information right now, for a decision on Monday night and approval, what you would be 
considering is amending the contract to eliminate the $160 pay rate for long-term subs because of the inequity it creates. It also uh, does a couple, th two or three things. Uh, it would bring in line um, what we pay, uh, other, other rates, um, and you know, we, we contracted with ESS to provide or fill those vacancies. So we no longer have to worry about finding those long-term subs. That's, that's the service we're paying for. So that would be ESS's responsibility for finding those long-term subs. So um, that would be one. Um, uh, number two, um, what it would do is it would bring the overall cost of ESS down because you're lowering the rate on one of those categories. Um, so that would... It brings the markup total cost down as well as the daily rate uh, charged to us down. So that brings the overhead down there. And then the third and final thing is having those, uh, having that long-term sub rate uh, of $160 per day, what that did was create a nightmare in payroll. Because if ESS or us either or well, weren't paying attention and they didn't change that substitute out of that long-term substitute status, they'd be paid right on and on and on on that rate, whether they were in fact acting as a long-term sub or not. And then you're in a position of trying <laughs> to reclaim that money. And that doesn't feel good. It just created a lot of confusion. So there's about three good reasons for eliminating the $160 rate. Um, and what I would also propose in this uh, um, addended contract with ESS is that the non-certified rate uh, be $105 and the non-certified uh, non be $105 and the certified rate be $120. Which that's a slight increase, correct, Jason? Five dollar increase for those two classifications. Any questions for me, or thoughts, or comments? Okay, how, how long is it, how much longer is this contract? The ESS contract. Yes. I'm gonna let Jason speak to that. It was a, a three year contract with uh, renewal you know, anytime we want it, or we can cancel it with a 30 day notice. Okay, so we're in year what? We're starting year two. Okay. And how much did it cost for it last year? The overall amount? Overall. I, Taylor would have to speak to that, I don't know. I can, while we're waiting for an exact figure, it's about 240,000. Okay, that's good enough. You just hit me in the head with a rock if that was way off and I'll correct <laughs> my statement, okay? That's just markup. That's you said I was close. I'm a pretty that's, good guesser. That's what we paid in addition. <clears throat> yeah. To use it. That's our cost. Yeah. Um, three years. Oh. <clears throat> So we paid, or we were invoiced for a total of about 1.25 million. About 235,000 of that was a markup. No, I'm sorry, about 308,000 was markup. 308, okay. Any questions or comments? Thanks for the that on that as well. So that'll be a, an approval item or a disapproval item uh, come Monday night. Number 25 so far. Have we talked, well, I know we're in a three-year contract, so we probably couldn't renegotiate that until the end of the third year. See if... We, we can renegotiate any time they're willing. Um, you know, the, we met with them towards the end of the year, Taylor and I did, um, and discussed 
the markup and different things, uh, and they went over with us their fill rate, which their overall fill rate was 91%. That's pretty good. Uh, most days, you know, that's very difficult days added in, but most days it was over 95, most days, some days 100%. Um, they filled a little over 9,000 absences last year. Our fill rate before them was in the roughly. In the mid-60s. There's what you're paying for. Yeah, that's what we're paying yeah. for. Yeah. You don't have a, a sub or a teacher in that classroom, that's a lost day in my opinion. You'd be correct. It, it, it's a hard decision. Um, you know, continue or don't continue budget cuts um, just recently upon us and potentially more needed in, in the near future. Um, and you know, the thing is, um, it, it gives those who choose to substitute opportunities provided by ESS that we cannot provide it. You know, they get insurance and they have special incentives that they can do that we cannot. Um, the downside is the money aspect. And, and so, you know, it's, it's really just a matter of, you know, are you willing to pay for the service or not? Um, but what, what I hope to do, um, is be able to gather more information uh, from teachers and administration and clerical um, to see because you know you put yourself in a teacher's shoes and you wake up sick the last thing you want to be doing while you are sick is finding your own substitute it's the last thing you want to do you want to be you want time to be sick so there's a value in that um, you look at it through another lens and, and you go, golly, you know, that's 300,000. What could we do? Or how far would that go toward another avenue, another alternative? Um, so it's a tough decision. I think my question is, have we explored the possibility of creating a position inside the school system that did that for, say, even a third of that or a fraction of that where you had a full-time or maybe two full-time people right. you could that was their job two over positions for that it wasn't I said you could just about have two positions for you that. you have more than two positions for that problem mm -hmm. but what you wouldn't have is a multi-county pool of substitutes they because of that I, I hear what you're saying and yes we have discussed that but they're pulling substitutes from Jackson and Buncombe and do we know the percentage of subs right now that are local Haywood County subs in that pool we probably don't do we know that yeah it's, it's probably 80 percent um they pull some from Jackson and some from Asheville but uh <laughs> you know the main thing here is in recruiting the subs yeah we can hire two people to manage it I've managed it before it's the ability to recruit them with more than just that daily rate and and that you can't keep enough I mean you have to have three times the number you need any given day to fill any given day because there's ones that won't work that day or they're sick or something else is going on or so you know we're running 80 subs a day on most days so you, you've got to have over 200 subs to make that work and that recruiting piece is what what they are bringing and and they can do that in ways we cannot and I was telling Dr. Putnam this Monday I think it was just in the last week I've talked three TAs out of quitting us and going to them and they told us that would happen they said, let us hang around long enough and, and your TAs will want to come to us to, to sub because it's a better deal. Why can they offer it and we can't? Are there laws against it? Yeah. It's state laws, yeah. yeah. Well, I was a substitute for 10 years, and I can tell you that I would have loved to have had the option to have had those benefits that they're able to offer. I think subs might stick with us, you know, stick with it a little bit longer. Um, with the amount of pay that they're getting along with the ability to work more and get benefits. 
from that from that angle, we're going to get better subs. Well, the way I look at it, unless the law changes, we're playing with the cards that don't even match up with what ESS can play with. It's like playing poker with a five card poker game with three cards. <laughs> have, have we looked at trying to get the laws changed because other, other school systems have to be having the same problems? Well, that's going to sound like casting stones. I'm certainly not. I'm trying to lay out events that kind of shaped where we are. Uh, you know, the General Assembly took an action to um, up the minimum pay rate and they didn't give us money to do that should they have done that absolutely absolutely and then some you know um, that pay rate needed to be adjusted for many many years um, but then it put uh, it created some unequal unfair uh, positions uh, for our employees um, you could, and this is something I'm actively working on now. Um, it, it meant in some instances where a clerical position could be just freshly hired on, making $15 an hour, and she looks across the way at her counterpart that's been with us for 20 years, and she's making 51 cents more an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality that has been created. And so... Um, you know, uh, and I, I'll talk about the next measure here in just a minute, but, you know, it, I, I'm working on a plan to correct that. But the bottom line is to increase their pay, it means that you, have, you need to have less positions, even less than we have now, or go into fund balance, which we do not have, uh, not much anyway, uh, and draw it from there. So, you know, you've got to create from within what what you have funding for, not your savings or your fund balance. And so the only way to do that is to reduce positions so that you can increase the pay for those who stay with you. The rules, the rules that cause a problem here are, are really finance type rules of not giving gift cards and incentives we can't do that kind of thing where they can short notice and take this job we'll give you a 25 50 dollar gift card now we're ultimately paying for that through the markup but we can't do it directly <laughs> you know um the other thing is uh, you when we hire the subs and they work for us we have to limit them to 12 days a month some of them want to work more than that. They can for ESS. We limit them to 12 days because if they go over 12 days on average month after month, under the federal insurance rules, we have to offer them health insurance at the tune of $8,000 per substitute. So that creates issues. Then also with um, health uh, care, if you take um, anyone that's working uh, like if you bring back a retired teacher, which we've done this year some, do long-term interims in classrooms we can't fill. We had a couple this year that we advertised all year long and couldn't fill. Uh, if you bring those teachers back, they can only work three months. Uh, because if, if they do, they have to come off the retiree insurance and come on the active insurance and they won't you know, I called down there and talked to him about it, and I said, where do we send the check? We're willing to pay it for four, five, six months. No, it don't work like that. You have to unenroll from the retiree, enroll, and then go back and forth, and no retiree wants to do that. Um, you can't just send a check down there to pay for it. So <laughs> um, there's lots of little things like that that ESS is designed to go around and to solve. That is very beneficial for schools and for teachers and kids, and and it it, it costs. I mean, nobody's denying that. Um, they came in just a smidge over what we estimated when we went with them. Of course, we didn't have the budget issues we had, you know, when we did that. But again, they filled over 9,000 absences this year. If that goes down, which it should, you know, we we were still coming off of COVID quarantines and such 
And if you do lower the long-term sub rate, that'll help a lot too. A long-term sub, time you paid the market, you're paying $200 a day, you know, close to it. So um, there's a lot there, you know, <laughs> that will get thrown into chaos if we don't do it. But if we don't have the money, we just don't have it. So. Dr. Putnam, you'd said you went to an ESS, maybe a little reception where you, how, and there was, the subs are very happy. They seem well, quite happy with the process. There wasn't a large number. Um, you know, there's probably a, a picnic table full, um, and I talked to them, and I didn't hear any uh, concerns or complaints. Um, you know, it was a, a multi-county gathering of Jackson County and Buncombe County and Haywood, uh, but I wanted to go in hopes of thinking all, thanking all of our substitutes for what they do, because that's an important thing that they do. They fill in for for us when, when others are sick. So I'm very grateful for that. And I was hoping maybe to uh, earn, gather a little bit of feedback, but it was, it was a pretty small representation. I think my take from what we're hearing is number one, we appreciate, we definitely don't want to make it harder on our teachers. We need to make it easier on our teachers, on our staff, on our administration, everything. However, I do think you're probably going to have to have to obviously renew it with a 30-day notice or whatever still being built into the contract. I do like that clause. And uh, I think we continue to lobby for being able to do it a different way, more, more reasonable, at a more reasonable cost. And the thing is, and, and I've talked to several administrators, principals and stuff at our schools, they love it. I mean, it frees them up that they're not sitting there trying to find subs. Or teaching or their Or their secretaries or whoever who's doing it. They're not worrying yourself to death trying to find subs all the time. Well, that's where and I that's a benefit to that they're not sitting there for an hour ever. I don't know when they do it, in the evenings, mornings, trying to find somebody to fill positions. That's working. I mean, that's, uh, believe me, I've, me and Mr. Hines, I've asked every question I think imaginable to him trying to trying to find out. I mean, I hate spending the three hundred thousand dollars. But on the other hand get a benefit out of it. You gotta think of value added, added value added versus go back and look at where we had the sixty percent fail rate and where was we standing at in the schools, how was the kids doing versus a ninety percent fail rate. When we talk about this every month in finance. We the same questions, month. the it's, same, yeah. we do the same Taylor thing. Gives us update same, every month. Up, same round table every month. You get the same, we come to the same conclusion. It's a benefit, it's working. Is the value worth 300,000? Sounds like to me 100%. If I'm wrong, I mean, you don't go, it's like buying a, a used car and a new car. Is it worth the value for 10 more years or is it worth the five years? I mean, that's what you're looking at. You're not comparing apples to apples. You're comparing value of having a 90% fail rate versus a 60% fail rate. Pretty much answers itself. I mean. Ronnie, I, I agree, know. and I think right now, <laughs> with teachers leaving and going to Buncombe County and us not being able to give them the amount of pay that other counties can, if it's something that's gonna help our teachers and make their lives a little bit easier, I wish we could give our teachers that money, but that doesn't work that way. Oh, I know, we'd like to do a but lot. But we've gotta look for ways to make our teachers' lives a little bit easier and them having to sit and make phone calls for two hours at night to look for a sub or to get up in the morning, time away from their family. Sick, like you said, like, exactly, like I think said. if it's something we can do for our teachers, then we've gotta keep doing what we're doing right now. Well, I think <coughs> it's a nail on the head. Building grounds never hears any. No, and you're right. We, we, I just think about that because we, years, so you we guys haven't been in here, Absolutely. but we talk about yeah. it every month because yeah, we, we ask every month for another year. So no, you're right. You're right. Uh, so it's J good. Jason. What is the the overhead that we're paying, or the percentage that we're paying on the markup? Isn't it 32.5? Right. 32.5. So if we could try to negotiate that down a little bit to help offset some of it, what? Well, and two, I don't want to leave you with the, the impression that that's kind of where we're at with it. I, I do plan to gather information more directly 
um, I'm just I'm sharing things I have learned or heard to this point but I don't I cannot sit here and say I have an accurate or complete representation of what everyone thinks of it and I want to get that for you and put that in front of you and, and I appreciate you doing that because that's where we're at I mean we need to know if I mean we are in one year but we can't cancel it in 30 days but I mean if it's working we would just need a lot of lead time we just need to know if we don't want to do it what's the what's our option right and that how are we going to how are we going to replace it if we do away with it right and have the the effectiveness that it's providing for us right carry on <laughs> exactly all right, and so uh, kind of these two kind of go hand in hand. Um, so one of the things we're, we're going to do for this year, um, at our uh, TA uh, group tends to turn over a good bit. Um, Jason can probably give you percentages on that. But in readying ourselves for a a potential another budget shortfall uh, any teacher assistant who leaves in the middle of the year they decide to resign or they decide to retire after the school year starts we will replace that position because obviously we saw fit to have it for the coming year we wouldn't have provided it to them so we would certainly replace it replace that position however person hired mid-year for replacing the position would be placed on a full-time temporary contract what that means is they would work a, a full work week and earn a full week's pay and a full month's pay just like everybody else the, the temporary designates that that contract would have an end date and it would be at the end of the school year and you know what that does is allow us to be ready should we have to make additional budget maneuvers at the end of the year because uh, as you heard miss garland say we still have positions in esser we have pay tables that are way out of whack for our our sort of non-certified and classified positions that have to be fixed so uh, just forecasting now and and being ready for uh, additional budget considerations um, next June. Hope we don't need them. If, if, en if uh, enrollment continues to decline, to decline, we we may very well need every bit of it. Um, if it begins to climb or holds steady, then maybe not. But I uh, just want to be in, uh, in a ready position should we need it. And that that item is not for approval. I just I want no, to just for information. For information, yes, sir. Well, and that's all I believe we have to present, unless anyone has okay. things to add. We're going to have a closed session this evening. Uh, have I have nothing unless Mr. Smathers does, or you, Mr. Chairman. We can do that Monday night. Okay, so we're good to go. Good go. All right. It's not an official meeting, so we'll just casually walk on out. Walk here. out at it. Right. <laughs> Thanks everybody for the prayers for Soren. I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks, Jimmy, and everybody.